Um, just to start the introduction, here's a picture from my neighborhood uh, of, a, of a set of solar panels that have been going up all over the place. And basically, the reason this is happening is that solar panels have become incredibly cheap, like compared to, you know, when I think we were first thinking about this 10 or 15 years ago, it was pretty expensive to put solar panels on your roof and it was something you did to do sustainable energy, not necessarily because you were trying to save a lot of money. And especially in the Pacific Northwest where we have fairly cheap hydroelectric power, which is arguably renewable, then I mean, why would you do it here? And I think the reason is that it's become so inexpensive and that's awesome. And so sort of based on that, a huge number of companies, like really large, very influential companies, like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, these huge companies that have dominated growth, economic growth in the US in the last 10 or years or so, have made major announcements, all pledging to become carbon neutral or carbon negative uh, by 2030 or 2035. So, and that's, if you think about it coming up pretty quick, that's like 10 years from now or 15 years from now. And, um, and it's based on this, the inexpense of being able to generate new renewable electricity relatively cheaply now. But uh, one of the issues is like, how do you put that into practice? Like you think about cloud services, I think most of us are familiar with cloud services through devices like we have in our hand. You know, you take a photograph and you upload that to the cloud. And so the energy use that you see or that you witness yourself personally is the recharging of the batteries in your mobile device. And um, what's easy to forget is that this is communicating at the other end over the internet with you know, uh, a, a, when you talk about cloud services, it's somewhere, there is a place somewhere um, called a data center where all of that information is flowing to and is being stored in hard drives. All the computation for cloud services is done in computers that are housed in rows and rows and rows of racks in giant buildings, giant air conditioned buildings uh, that basically house all this computer infrastructure. And uh, the electricity being consumed for all of these cloud services is enormous. So taking all the electricity that in the US that's used at this point, a 2% of it is cloud services. And that is rapidly growing at more than 10% per year. So it's a rapidly growing energy demand. Right now, all of it it's, it's completely beholden to whatever electricity is available. So if you build a data center in Seattle and you have excess renewable energy from hydroelectric power, great. Then you can argue that your data center is carbon neutral. But if you build it anywhere else, you know, you build it somewhere, you know, in the middle of the country somewhere, you're, you're, you got to plug it into whatever is being produced in the grid in that area. And if it's coal burning power plants, then that has a direct CO2 impact. So it's a huge issue and cloud companies are very worried about this because like, how are they ever, how are they gonna do that? How are they gonna solve this problem? And, you know, if you just look at the photograph here of this, of this, this is a Google data center. I mean, yeah, you could probably put solar panels on the roof, right? But there is no way <laughs> that that amount of solar panels is gonna cover the power requirements for this data center. It's an incredibly energy intensive thing. So it requires a huge amount of electricity and we've got to collect it somewhere. And yes, theoretically we could collect it with wind and solar panel panels, but where is it gonna go? And the bigger problem is the sun is only shining during the day. So what do you do at night? This data center is operating 24 seven only some part of the day are we actually available? Do we have power available from a renewable source? Um, just to illustrate that point, this is a plot of the total non-solar electricity demand. So it's the part of the electric, electrical grid in California, this is for California specifically. Um, it's the amount of electricity demand during a 24 hour cycle in California that is not solar electricity. 
And what you see, if you look at 200, 2012, you have kind of, it's kind of flattish and there's a, a big lump in the middle of the day. And then there's another lump later in the evening. And basically that represents the big slugs of energy demand, like in the middle of the day, business hours, like mid morning, there's lots of electricity demand. And then when people come home in the evening, six to 8 PM, everybody flips their lights on. There's another huge slug of energy demand. And so you see that. Um, but what's happened over, you know, approximately 10 year period is so people have been putting up cheaper and cheaper solar panels all over the California. And, and now like you get to around today, there's a huge drop in the non-solar energy demand that happens in the middle of the day. And that's because the sun is shining and all these solar panels are producing electricity and putting it onto the grid and there's too much electricity. So what happens is the non-solar power, they, they cycle down uh, power plants during the middle of the day. So they don't want, because they don't want to waste the fuel basically. And, and, and you, can only, you can only turn down so much. So some, some gas turbine systems have to be operating at some level just to keep running. You have nuclear power plants that you can't really turn off. So there, there is a minimum. And at some point you, you get so much power coming out of these solar panels that you, you can't do anything with them and you literally just don't use the capacity. Uh, it's called curtailment. The amount of curtailment that's going on in California during the middle of the day now is just enormous. To compound the problem, like you get to the end of the day, all the solar panels start stop producing power and you gotta turn all of these power plants back on again uh, to, to meet the sudden demand that you have like right going into the evening hours. And that's what this curve shows is sort of this drop and then sudden just spike upward at around 6 p.m. as the sun goes down. You suddenly have this massive uh, non-solar energy demand that's really, really, really hard for, for the grid to handle. Uh, and it's created all kinds of blackout problems and it creates a lot of extra soot because of the startup of these engines and so forth. Um, and it, it ultimately limits how, how much solar capacity you can even have, because you can keep adding as many solar panels as you want to. It's not going to solve this problem. So the basic issue is at the end of the day, you have to find a way to store the electricity that you're collecting. If you collect all this uh, uh, electricity during the day and you have a way to store it, then things can go toward 100% renewability. We can get to the point where all the electrical power, uh, possibly even all the transportation power is renewably gathered using an electricity source. But that's predicated on an ability to, to, to store energy at a massive scale, which we have never done before. So one, there, there's, I would, and I would say there's basically two thoughts or two ways people are thinking about solving the storage problem. Um, one is with batteries. So it's kind of like an extension of what we already do at the cell phone level. We plug the cell phone in for an hour or two, recharge it, and then we can use it all day long. Can't we just do that? Um, the issue there is scale. But just to give you an idea, like how, how many batteries would you need to do that? Um, this buddy of mine, Jack Brower at UC Irvine, did this calculation once where he basically imagined every single car in California was electric. So get rid of all the gasoline cars and replace every single vehicle with a, with a battery powered car. And then you don't use the cars, you just plug them into the grid and their only function is to store solar electricity in the middle of the day uh, in order to help level and provide the storage for this, this cycling of, of, of power demand. It's only about 1% of the necessary storage you would need. So it's a massive scale. The number of batteries we're talking about is absolutely huge. And it's, it's people, are, people legitimately debate whether that's even possible. Is it sustainable? The manufacturing, the materials necessary to make lithium ion batteries uh, at that scale. Um, uh, but the other, is some type of electrical, electrochemical energy conversion. And that's what takes us in sort of the subject of this course, which is fuel cells. 
So the idea is that you don't try to do everything with electrification. You try to, to couple uh, the electrical power grid with, the, with fuel infrastructure, taking electricity, which you're collecting from solar panels or wind, and then you use that excess electricity to synthesize fuel. And the simplest one to think about is hydrogen. So you take water, you use the electricity to electrolyze the water forming hydrogen. You store the hydrogen in a pipeline network, which is um, much, much cheaper to do than trying to do batteries. You store this, this, this hydrogen in a pipeline network, and then you draw down that hydrogen uh, at nighttime when you don't have the sun shining and you, you convert the hydrogen back to electricity. So we take the electricity, convert it to a fuel, and then we take that fuel and convert it back to electricity. And that is the essence, the essence of electrochemical energy conversion. So one side of that is electrolysis. We take electricity, and in, this shows a, a, an oxide ion based solid oxide electrolysis cell where we're basically taking a water it's, as a gas in this case and um, splitting it into hydrogen and then O2. And then you can do the reverse. And that's what we would call a fuel cell. Um, so, so you do electrolysis during the day when you have electricity available and then you run a fuel cell at nighttime. And there's people even developing what's called reversible fuel cells that can go bi-directional. They act as an electrolysis device during one part of their cycle, and then they act as a fuel cell during the other part of the cycle and go back the other way. So you take, in this case, oxygen and hydrogen, and you recombine them back into water and you make electricity. Um, okay. So, so that's the basic idea. So to summarize that, where, where do fuel cells in sort of, in my view, where do they fit into the, into the world? They would fit into this energy storage. Um, uh, they basically address the energy storage need, the ability to take fuel, take electricity, convert it to fuel and then and convert the fuel back. I would say the technology for electrolysis is very, very similar to fuel cells. So if you learn a lot about fuel cells, you're also just indirectly learning a lot about electro electrolysis too.